I love reading to the kids. I would say like some of my favorites are Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe because I can do like, I have like, which you can attest to, like five or six stupid English accents that I can do and like yeah. a Scottish accent and stuff. So it's like fun to be Mr. Beaver and like be um, like Father Christmas and stuff. So let me hear it. Which one? Mr. Beaver is the best one because um, oh, Mr. Beaver. <laughs> It's Ray Winstone, because he's him in the movie. I, I can't think of other lines. Um, when did Edmund leave? And it's fun, too, because he's like a little beaver, which is the joke in the movie. I didn't make that up. Um, but those read aloud go well, because also the line, The Witch in the Wardrobe. I read a book. I have three classes, so I read it three times a year, and this will be the fifth year I've done it. So I've read Lion, The Witch in the Wardrobe like 22 times in the past four years. And it is so good. It, like, holds up. What, is, what do you get out of it, do you feel like? I mean, reading a book that many times, do you feel like you rediscover stuff each time? Yeah. I definitely like a rapt audience. Like, when the moment that you realize Mr. Tumness, he's, like, crying, and she's like, what's wrong, what's wrong? And he's like, I've done something bad. And she's like, oh, it can't be that bad. And, and you, you realize before she realizes that he's kidnapped her every single time. The whole room is like, and that is just like, uh, it's so cool to watch kids. Because I don't know if you remember that scene, but I remember feeling that for the first time. He's such a good character. And it's insane. That's chapter two that um, they develop the relationship and Tumnus like helps her out. And Tumnus is actually barely in the book past that chapter, but it is like, everybody remembers him. That scene is so effective. It's really powerful. It, it just made me realize, too, it's like that's a form of performance, reading to kids. It's kind of underrated. Totally. I would say, particularly during distance learning, I'll, my job has always been a degree of performance. I love doing the history classes. Like, we talk about Julius Caesar, and I, like, dramatize, you know, him coming back to the Senate and getting stabbed and stuff. There is always this element of performance and I feel like with remote learning it, it went up like my job more than anything was to just keep the kids sitting still for 45 minutes like looking at the camera um, and I do think it's something that has always drawn me to the job I like like maybe performing for kids I guess well it makes me think of like when we were in college in film school together like pitching you know like yeah. pitching screenplay ideas and stuff like that like you are always really good at that thank you well, one thing that you do in teaching is you do like a launch of a unit. So you'll have to pitch the book and get them excited for it. And so, I mean, that's not quite what you're saying, but there's a bit of that overlap too. The other day we were doing um, guide words in the dictionary. Those are like the words at the top. And my first two classes were like sort of boring. And I was like, all right, guys, I'm going to give you like, you're in secret agent school. I'm going to give you a series of code words. You've got to use these like, they know what the dictionaries were, but... They'd seen them before, too. I was like, I'm going to give you these, like, decoders here. You've got to use the decoders to crack the, like, spy words that I'm giving you here to figure out the code. And that class ran so much better because they just, like, loved the stupid narrative. There was nothing on the worksheet about, you know, spy school or anything. But I was like, I, I, you, if you form the narrative for kids like that, they're so much more on board. And I think that's why the read-alouds are so fun. I don't really have to convince anyone the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is great. And how about your writing that you do for yourself? Because you've done a lot of writing. I mean, you've been published and pretty prolific, like as long as I can remember. remember. Mm -hmm. I, w one of the things that makes teaching really attractive to me is I get the summers. So I'm able to do a lot over the summer. It's harder during weekdays. I used to do it at night when I got home, but and I still could probably, but right now with my schedule, I have a pretty sizable like lunch break in the middle of the day. And it's, it's supposed to be prep. It's like a sub block. I'm supposed to be on campus. Um, and then time for my lunch. But it's like two and a half hours. So I do a class. I have this break, and then I do two classes. And what I've been doing is I get off campus. We're right by the Ikea in Red Hook, which the Ikea actually has like this really beautiful like pier side park. Yeah. And I've been going there for 45 minutes. And... All right, and that has been awesome. I used to, when I started, like five or six years ago, trying to write consistently, 
I got up really early. So I'd get up at 6 a.m. and I'd do a couple hours. I think that was really good for then. Scheduling has become a skill and like the discipline has become a secondary skill that has been really important to all this. I feel like that's something people don't always think about with writing and a lot of things, but it's like, you're like, when you answer it, you're like logistics. Yeah. You're not like, here's my creative process. You're like, I just have to make time for it. Cause that seems to be a really important factor. Yeah. Um, the Stephen King book on writing, I would recommend it if everybody is trying to make a discipline out of it. He has an insane discipline. So I just started with his. His was like, you got to sit at your computer for two hours and you don't have to be touching the keys. Well, I don't know if he said page count. It's something like this. Um, you don't have to be touching the keys. You don't have to write anything, but you're not allowed to do anything else. So that's where I started like five or six years ago because I wasn't capable of producing for two hours. I don't Produce know if anyone can. I mean, that's crazy. That's a lot. What he does is pages. I think if he does three pages, he like gives himself the rest of the day off and that they sometimes come fast, they sometimes come slow. I think time worked for me because sometimes it would flow out of me and sometimes I'd feel stumped. But this idea of like putting my phone away, turning off the internet, sitting here for two hours, so that's where I started. And if I didn't hit the two hours, it didn't count for me. Um, I've now gone a little easier. So now on a weekday, if I can put in five minutes, I count it. I have like a little app where I track it. And then on the weekends, I usually get more time. So like two or three hours. And then over the summer, I get a lot of time. I can like put in semi-real days over the summer. But this is the long version of what well, um, he, Stephen King says something um, that like writing is, should be like any other work. It should be like breaking rocks in the sun. Um, and so there are like, sometimes I'm inspired, but I would say the times I'm inspired, I'm not even sure the writing is better. Like the times I'm inspired are like, it almost is like this manic energy, like this fake sugary sweetness that doesn't last for me. And then if I get an extreme high from writing, I seem to really drop down. Um, and the next couple of days are harder. So I almost prefer the day that's like, show up at the desk, put in my 45 minutes, nothing spectacular happened, but like when I walk away, it counts. I almost prefer that to you know, an extreme high. I had a couple weeks ago, this like explosion burst of energy. I got this idea that was really personal and I was like, I just gotta do it. And I wrote this screenplay in four days, which was really exciting. Like every day was really exciting. And I felt cool to tell people that. I'm getting like a little cheap burst right now and telling you that. But then afterwards for the next couple days, I felt like really gross and I couldn't write. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I, I have such a weird relationship with telling people about the writing and keeping it to myself. I want people to know that it's important to me. I wonder if even after this interview, I'll have like a emotional hangover. I, I try to really internalize the like, if I get validation, it's good, but it's not necessary. I, this is also a Stephen King thing. Those are all my rejection letters. Oh, nice. uh, they're not all of them, but they're... A collection. <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering even now by telling you that I have that, if it's like sort of cheating. I guess, I guess it's whatever you make it, but I try so hard because I'm afraid if this were to ever pay off and I would get validation, would I stop or would my discipline get worse? There's this... We, we studied, we went to film school. And so I, f I see it the most with film is that you have this amazing movie and then there's so often the follow-up movie is bad. And I'm so, I don't want to like lose, I guess the discipline or the focus if something were to ever like pay off. I don't want to be doing it for the validation. The, the little bit each day that I'm telling myself I'm not doing for other people, I'm doing for myself is consistent and sustainable and something that's really important to me. Though it is a slight lie because like, I love sharing it too and people being like, I sent you a story and you gave me cool notes. Yeah. And it felt so validating to get cool notes from you and to say that like certain things landed for you. And then it does give you energy. Like I was able to take some of that energy and sit down again the next day. Um, I don't know, I don't totally have solved why I feel gross sometimes about sharing. Well, this is funny. Uh, 
So I actually have a story coming out on Friday, which I have been, it has been like the most excruciating publishing process ever. Because all of these magazines, they don't make any money. Like Ted is the only person I have ever met who for a little while bought a sci-fi lit mag. Like nobody does that and that's what I'm sending to. And so I had a story that got accepted last, not this past April, but the April before. No one told me for like five months. I finally reached out and they were like, oh yeah, you got accepted. I was like, what? And they were like, yeah, the editor will reach out to you soon. I have been in email communication with this guy since last October, a year ago. He, he emails about once a month. If I send him an email, a month passes before he emails, his back, emails back. And I just haven't heard it from him since like March this past year. And it was so excruciating because it was such a high when I got it accepted. And I told my family, and they were like, oh, we can't wait to see it. And then month after month after month after month passed. And I can't get mad because these magazines are like, provide me places to send things. If they didn't exist, like, there is absolutely the goal of sending things. Like you said, you want people to see these stories. Um, but oh my God, it would just like keep me up at night frantically checking these emails. So they started to get sort of punchy. And I was like, well, here's my monthly check-in. Like, and he finally messaged yesterday and was like, we're running it on Friday. So who knows if it will actually even run. Um, but it's like none of this has been sexy yet. Like none of this. <laughs> if the payoff is validation, there hasn't been much of it. But you still keep going. It's really satisfying. I know like um, my brother like would run for a while and he like got me into running a little bit after college. And I think he said something like, you know, the best part of running is those one or two minutes where you really are like, or exercising in general, I guess, not just running, where you are so tired, you you genuinely do like only stop, start thinking about your body and you're no longer thinking like how much longer you have to go. And when I used to run, I would only get like a minute or two of that where you'd suddenly realize you like hit a trance state or whatever. And I think that's sort of the goal for all our hobbies. Like you do a hobby to sort of hit that sort of trance. It is the most sustained for me with writing. Putting on mu I listen to a ton of music. My Spotify is so fucked with soundtracks. Like my, uh, Chrissy and I, my girlfriend and I, I did the new Spotify thing where you can like merge playlists and her music's cool. And my music is like the soundtrack to 1917 to Midsummer to like Hereditary and like piano music. It's all not <laughs> fun for someone else to listen to. But music is a big way for me to get to that place. Particularly if I've like just taught a class, just sent off some parent emails, walk to this Ikea park, sit down, get like a whew, and like that music will, but sometimes no music, sometimes just like staring off into space. Music though totally helps me set the tone. If it's like a horse, you can put on a horse soundtrack. And how about characters? Where do you, what do you draw on for that? So, I, maybe this is typical of a lot of writers, but I notice it the most when white guy writers write white guy leads. They're so boring. Mm -hmm. um, I'll try to think of some other examples. I, I think you see it a lot of times in movies. But so I've experienced that problem too. So like this novel project, the main character is a white dude who's like 26 and he's not that different from me and it's been a real struggle to make him an interesting character. Whereas another important character in this story is a woman in an unhappy marriage who's a professor who cares more about her work than necessarily like her family life. And she was so much more real so faster and so much more fun to write. I don't know, because it, w it felt like total imagining. So I think this might be the last time I try to write someone that similar to me. I don't know. I, I sort of learn, I've begun to learn what's fun for me and what's not. I will never write a cop or do my best to never write a cop again. I did another project with cops and I don't know a thing about cops. And I realized about halfway through that my cops were just these amalgam of cop movie cliches and I wasn't having fun because I knew I wasn't bringing anything new. The only new thing I could bring was um, like a new combination of the cliches. And so there are certain things like that that don't, that aren't exciting for me to write. 
I love writing kid and adult friendships. The story I sent you was like a kid and adult friendship. Mm -hmm. I love writing from kids' point of view, maybe because you know I'm around kids all the time. Do you think it's possible to write characters that you aren't familiar with, or you just have to research? Yeah, I think it's totally possible because this this woman character I was talking about was like in an unhappy marriage. I don't even know where that came from. Like, I don't know where she came from, but I love writing her. I mean, it's a good question. You think I would do a better job at like a 31-year-old dude my age? And in that screenplay I was telling you about, the main guy character is essentially me. But that was fun to write because I knew I was going to get like killed in a horrible way in the end. And so I could accentuate my flaws in such a way because I knew I was like... <laughs> I wasn't going to get away with any of them by the end. It made me think of uh, like the guy that makes a, a Dungeons & Dragons character, because we played a bunch of D&D together. Like, they make themselves, you know what I mean? And they're like, he's really cool, he's wearing a black trench coat, he's really good with swords and guns. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it's like they can't separate themselves, so they can't give them any flaws, or like they, they can't see it objectively. I think that's such a good point. And when you like put them in a tight situation where maybe their their skills or whatever don't shine, I feel like that person doesn't always react so well. Well, can't I just use my sword? Like, why can't I just cut him down? You're like, well, you know, it's an illusion. That's a really good point. Some of the best stories are stories that instantly put into the, the viewer's mind how the whole thing's going to go. And then... The excitement is watching how it doesn't go that way. So uh, I'm trying to think of a good popular example. This is all I can think of because it does it in a really good way. There was a Reddit story that got really popular like a year and a half ago because it got bought for like $7 million and that's never happened before. And it was like a after dark. It was just like four Reddit threads, but it was someone's yeah. made up story that was meant to feel sort of hyper real. Mm -hmm. And it was um, a couple that moves into a house, they find out the house is haunted, and they get told that each season the, God, the, the ghost appears in a different way. So you as the reader from the very beginning are told how it's going to go. And some of the fun is like, is it real or not? But then when it starts to show up, you as the reader begin to have expectations, and then it gets fun when the expectations get flipped. Wow, I talked to you about it before with Squid Game. There are characters who say a couple things, do a couple of movements, and you feel like you know them. And it's really fun to watch a character because you, you kind of have an idea of what their challenges are going to be, where they're going to excel, and I would love to get there. I've been practicing and trying more with my writing to have a certain confidence with my characters to, like, the reader has a pretty good idea of them when they show up. So then the ways they deviate from that or the ways that they stick to that, that becomes exciting for a reader. What is it between like it, it really feeling authentic and kind of falling flat, like it being unbelievable? I would say like some of it has to do with cliche and what screenplay I wrote in high school or college. Um, it was this couple having this big blowout fight and she's like throwing dishes into the wall and screaming and stuff. And my dad read it and was not impressed. <laughs> and it was like, it ruined me because I thought it was a really good scene. But he said something like, you know, sometimes the scariest, like, it can be really scary when someone's so angry that they're actually, like, kind of quiet and reserved. And I didn't know that as a kid. So maybe, like, the more you are able to sort of observe, it's like when I, you know, the one thing I can confidently say is when I write kid reactions, they are usually kind of true to life and effective, maybe because, like we said before, I have been around kids so much. Um... But yeah, you can, you can call bullshit so quick. And you can know in minutes if something's for you or not, or if you're going to buy it or not. And then when fully re realized characters interact with each other in believable ways, I mean, I feel like as a writer, you're on a whole nother level. That's something I struggle with too. If you're going to put two characters in the room together, they should affect each other in really exciting ways. If they act the same way they did before they came into the room, or the same way they did with... A character in a previous scene, something's going wrong. Because I talk to you, Christian, different than I talk to Chrissy, my girlfriend, different than I talk to my employees, or employees, colleagues. <laughs> Nobody works for me. Do you ever feel paralyzed by seeing successes oh. and failures? I sometimes wonder too, like, best case scenario, 
I create something, it does well, it makes me some money, and I am able to make a somewhat of a life out of it. Sometimes I wonder, will I look back and realize that the best writing time of my life is right now? I don't love how little I get to write, but there are very few expectations to me. Me plugging away at a page, people have read short stories of mine, but um, it still is this like little secret that is mine. And I honestly do think, sometimes I make stupid decisions, sometimes I come back the next day and I'm like, that sentence was actually dumb. Um, but I really think it's this, the project I'm talking about is this bigger project I've been working on for like five or six years, this novel project. And I really think it has, time has benefited it, only benefited it. And if you had had to put it out on a deadline, it might have hurt. Totally. And I think that's sometimes why you get these follow-up books or movies that feel sort of slapped together. Because people are either full of themselves or you have a lot of yes men around you who do just want to get the next thing out. Um, I read recently that it was rushed for different reasons, but I think of Casino Royale is like, in my opinion, like one of the best Bonds ever. It's followed up by Quantum of Solace, which is like one of the worst Bonds ever. I heard recently it was because of a writer's strike that part of the rush, but that's such a good example. Like, how did you get the scenario that made Casino Royale? How do you do that again the second time when you're riding the high of how good your first one was? I feel like I don't want to have you take this the wrong way, but it, it almost feels like you're afraid to succeed. You know what I mean? Because I feel that sometimes. It's like, well, what if? You know, like, what if I was like, the super successful person. Oh, it would suck. You know, it's like <laughs> everything, like everything would change, you know, like I wouldn't be able to do this and that. That'd be so cool. Well, it's like, it's kind of a good question. It's a good way to put it because it's like, what will I do when I win the lottery? Like, will I still be like so chill to be around with my million dollars? Maybe it is, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a good point. Like, Chrissy had to have a serious talk with me a couple years ago and I was really glad for it. She said something like, I, I feel like my life hasn't started yet. Like everything up until the first writing success is just like prequel, prologue or whatever. And she kind of shook me and was like, your life is like right now, man. Like it started. And that was a good thing to hear. And that actually since has made the writing while I teach a lot more sustainable. I will probably teach my whole life. I, I think there are very few writers in the world who don't teach. So I think my best case scenario is I get to make some money off this while teaching. So this has sort of helped prepare me for that. And I realize I do really like teaching. Yeah, it's, I feel like it's built up a lot. Like, if you don't have this major success, you're not a success. Yeah. But I don't think that's true at all. I don't think so either. And it's been a struggle. Not a struggle is not the right word. But like, I don't always know how to talk about it. I l clearly, I really like talking about it. I have a lot of thoughts on it. But... It feels like douchey to be like, I'm a writer, I'm an artist, I'm a musician. But it, it's a bit of what you're saying too, like if you make music, you're a musician. If you paint, you're an artist. If you write, you're a writer and you can, I can't take my own advice, but like you should be able to tell people that and talk about it in a candid like way. Like right now feels really good because you have given me permission to just like talk about this as much as I want. Yeah, that's, so that's the thing I need to work on because I think a certain amount of validation, a certain amount of celebrating yourself is good and is necessary. I have seen myself get really puffed up with validation. Like oh, with the writer's group. I will have a couple sessions in a row where they were just like, oh my the story, this moment is so great. And so then the writer's group for a while will become for me like, this is the place where I bring my stories and everyone talks about like how sick they are. And then every couple sessions, I'd bring a story in that wasn't good. It like needed work, they'd give me notes and I'd be in a bad mood, I'd be pissy. And that is such a baby reaction. And so I think I, I don't like when I'm that way. So maybe some of these like fail safes I've built in or am trying to build in or like struggling to build in is I don't want to ever get to the point where people are, I care about are giving me good feedback and I'm just crossing my arms and saying they don't get it. And I think there just is this dream. Like I studied, I did some work with Moby Dick in undergrad. It's awesome. But there is this whole myth around it that he wrote it in two drafts. Mm -hmm. 
essentially two giraffes. And I think we love this idea of like someone's eyes rolling back in their head. It's just like coming out of their fingertips, like gasping at the end. And it's what you get in your hands. And so I think some of the trick of getting a published book that feels slick and feels concise is you make your 54th draft feel like a first draft. Because there is this glamour to a first draft, a flow to a first draft. But if it's an imperfect first draft, you know, you've got to change it. It's not going to work the way it is, no matter what is good about it. What advice would you give to people who are thinking about pursuing writing? Um, turn back. <laughs> turn back. If, if you haven't gotten it by now, discipline. But I, it's such a weird balance because you also have to go easy on yourself. If you say, I need to do, you, it's got to be sort of achievable. So say you say, I write four days a week and I'm done when I produce a thousand words. If on you know, week four, you aren't able to do that fourth day, something really bad has happened to you, it's Sunday, you're going to miss your deadline, you also have to be kind to yourself. Because I think there's a version where you say, like, fuck it. I ruin the discipline, like when you break the diet and you're like, I'm not going to do it anymore. There does need to be this degree of softness. If I, now for me, I, I was always so afraid that I was going to lose this ability for a long time. Now I know I won't. Now I know if I go a couple of days without writing, I like don't feel good, like I'm in a bad mood. And I think that's the same with like a lot of habits, a lot of hobbies, good and bad. Um, so if I sit down and like delete a comma, I check the box for that day. It counts now. Because I know Saturday morning I might do three hours. Early in like my real, I, I consider like my real writing life starting from 25. That's like when I began to show up, really show up to it and like do two hours in the morning. I was talking on the phone, on the phone to my brother. I think doing something similar, like what is a pro what's a discipline that works for me, what's a pattern that works with me, what's going to make me stick to it. And he said something along the lines of, um, well, if you wanted to be a professional basketball player, you'd play basketball every day, right? And that, like, was such an aha moment that to this day that is still sort of how I convince myself to sit down and work. Chrissy just read this. I guess, you know, on Twitter there was a thing again about Squid Game. Yeah. Um, about how I guess he had the writer had shopped this around for like 10 years and at one point was so poor he had to sell his laptop and people were like that's the dedication it takes like wow man and then there was like another a second thought on it all where it was like why is that what it has to take like why did this dude have to do all this this is such a good idea and I think the monetization sometimes like um, you know Netflix just pumps out this sci-fi garbage like one in five sci-fis that Netflix makes is any good because they know sci-fi will sell and like get viewers. So how many risks are they taking? I mean, they took a risk on Squid Game, I guess, but there aren't a ton of risks. Um, I can read to you this quote here because it, yeah. it ties in thematically and is like a mantra I try to remind myself and can maybe be a useful thing for whoever. But it's from Annie Dillard, who is a uh, like essayist. I had the handwriting, I didn't have a printer at the time, but there is neither a proportional relationship nor an inverse one between a writer's estimation of work in progress and its actual quality. The feeling that the work is magnificent and the feeling that it is abominable are both mosquitoes to be repelled, ignored, or killed, but not indulged. And that's like if you feel good about it, you feel bad about it or not, like just get to work. I like that. I like that one a lot. <laughs>